Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Savas Kliamfus. I'm the head of engineering of Parser Vision. Um, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Dario and Oliver for having me today. And today I'm going to be speaking about becoming a high performance organization and how to stay one. Um, well, that was initially the plan. Unfortunately, it's obviously like a very big subject. So um, I had like a small change of, uh, of, of target with this presentation. And I'm going to be presenting uh, the top tips on how to become a high performance organization. I did this so that I would um, present some things that you can adopt um, uh, selectively, depending on your situation and your context, uh, to start seeing measurable difference in your day-to-day -day performance, uh, so that you can then get buying from the rest of the business uh, to adopt some of the more challenging uh, aspects of, um, of, of, of the process that is necessary to, in becoming a high-performance organization. It's not always easy, by the way. Um, roughly the schedule, I'm going to be speaking about how this came to be, what this is, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to go through a short explanation of high performance, uh, and there's an interesting bit there uh, that needs to be discussed, I think, before we go to the, um, uh, to the tips, and then the middle of the presentation is going to be me presenting uh, six tips about operational performance, and uh, we're going to see why that matters later. I, I aim I'll try to leave some time, uh, a lot of time for Q&A because uh, this talk is basically uh, what you need to do in the sense of uh, these are like three things that you need to, uh, to adopt without going into a lot of detail about how do you do that, how do you adopt those, uh, those particular practices, it's just what you need to do. Uh, so it's kind of an index to help you on your way, so like a, a short map, um, but without a lot of um, drilling in with regards to each of the practices. Some of them are quite involved in fact, so you need to do uh, some study uh, before you start adopting it. But um, I'm saving you a lot of the research that is necessary in doing so. But that's, that's basically the goal. So um, why this came to be? So how, how did this start? Well, uh, some time ago, I joined Passive Vision. Uh, when I joined, I was the, um, I was, I joined as a, a tech lead and kind of in an architectural position. But very soon, uh, I found out that I actually had to fill in the roles of, uh, of the head of engineering. And it was a new team, a new project, entirely Greenfield, but nothing was there, just an idea from the uh, owner of the company. Uh, because he, he used to work in uh, logistics quite a lot and noticed a lot of, a lot of the problems. And I, I was in need to establish a certain process uh, that we need to follow. I mean, and everybody knows that waterfall is bad, but um, Agile has a set of practices, um, but alone themselves is usually not enough. There are other things that you need to consider. And moreover, there is a lot of, um, a lot of advice, a lot of good, good advice about um, you should adopt this, you should do this, you should do that other thing. And it's a lot of um, information, a lot of workshops that are, are meant to help you, a lot of practices that you should do, and each of them has a different benefit. And there is a lack of documentation on how things fit, actually fit together. So uh, there is some hints here and there about the different parts potentially uh, working with, with others, but you don't know when these do not. And you also there is a lack of documentation of a, a process from start to finish of you should be doing this, and then you should be doing that, then you should be doing that, and then I tell it like this. So, well, there is some of that uh, in Agile. That is, well, there is a quite a significant amount of, uh, of, of, of information there, but it doesn't deal with uh, how do you actually go about building the product. It's about eliciting feedback and, and how development happens, but it doesn't speak about an analysis and architecture, for example. And, and there are people that there is some information there, there but as I said, it's, uh, it's, it's not a lot. Um, I spent quite a lot of time studying. I, um, I, I reached out and, and also tried to study about, um, try to find knowledge outside of the domain of software development as well, not just uh, within our, uh, our current uh, work profession. And, and I have been working for a little bit more than a year now on a process that um, will allow uh, new teams, essentially, but most uh, easily, is, uh, this is adopted by a new team, 
but also uh, an approach that can be adopted gradually by established teams in order to become high performance organizations. Before I continue on to the tips, uh, yeah, I, I just want to give a definition of what exactly are we talking about uh, when we're speaking about the high performance organization. Uh, the definition I use is uh, that a high performance organization is uh, a learning organization which relentlessly delivers value to its customer. So it's an organization which relentlessly, um, with relentless, I mean, uh, continuously deploying new features into production without stopping, but making informed decisions about what to actually uh, deliver to the customers and, and, and iteratively finding out exactly what um, that value means. In order to understand what the high performance is, I think uh, a useful um, way to do that is actually comparing high performance organization with the low performance organization. And uh, these are some of the statistics that are taken off from the Accelerate uh, book, uh, which was a research in the industry. And what they found out is that there are some, um, in some cases, there are orders of magnitude um, a difference between uh, some key metrics from high performance and low performance. So one indicative one is that a high performance organization is 440 times faster uh, to deliver a code that got committed uh, into, um, into their trunk uh, into a production. So the time it takes from committing to trunk and getting into production is four, 440 times faster. 170 times faster time uh, to recover uh, from downtime. So these are uh, a huge difference between low performance and high performance. Now, why is that important? So the state of DevOps report of 2014 was the, um, the beginning of this journey, and they alluded to this. So what they found out empirically was that there was a relationship between operational performance and organizational performance. So what they found out is, uh, so the code is taken directly from state of DevOps, is that um, high-performing IT organizations were actually twice as likely to exceed their profitability markets. So operational performance actually meant more money. Uh, and, and this is the uh, organizational performance that we're interested in. That's the definition of organizational performance. So, and then later on, we're still, um, I, 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 this is again from the Accelerate book. Uh, there was a scientific study done as part of the, um, of the Accelerate book. And they, they found scientific proof that there is a causal relationship between software delivery performance, and this is the operational performance that I was referring to earlier, with organizational performance, which means profits. And, and this is scientifically proven, so that it, this is no longer a debate, and, and there's no, a, it's not, no longer something that we can discuss. It, it has been actually proven. So what's our experience with the framework that, um, that, that I have been working on? Um, so after adopting this at uh, the beginning of this year, um, we've noticed that we went down from uh, uh, deploying once or twice per sprint to deploying 10 times a day. Uh, work lead time went down from three to four weeks to four to five days. Work lead time is basically for this quest for a feature uh, to actually that feature being uh, merged into master and deployed. And then uh, deployment lead time went from five days approximately to something close to 15 minutes. So we now uh, sit in the high performance organization definition within the uh, state of DevOps report. So now on to the need of the presentation. So six tips to achieve of operational performance, which will lead into organizational performance. So tip number one, which I think based on my experience at least is the more important one, is how to um, achieve a meaningful decomposition. The decomposition that I'm referring to here is the decomposition of responsibilities of a system into, uh, let's say, services. So, uh, services because you were in Microsoft is uh, mid right? <laughs> So, um, this is decomposing the responsibility, meaning that uh, we decide that this piece of code, this service is responsible to do, um, I don't know, uh, shipping, this piece of code is responsible for invoices, this piece of code is responsible for X, Y, and Z. So, that's the decomposition of a system into, uh, into services that I'm referring to. So 
how do you achieve that meaningfully? How do you get to a meaningful, useful decomposition that will not hurt you in the future? So based on my experience and what I'm suggesting uh, is uh, the use of bounded context. Bounded context is a concept that emerged from domain design. And it basically is, uh, it represents a boundary uh, around some functionality that is discovered through differences in the meaning of certain terms. Now, it may sound a little bit complicated, but it really is not all that complicated. In fact, it's, this happens when we are talking with different subject matter experts. We are discovering that, um, for example, they, have the, they acknowledge the term of a shipment. A shipment is something that I, I work day today on my, on my current position. So the shipment from in one bounded context may be represented by uh, a tracking number, for example, and that's all it is in one bounded context and one uh, subject matter expert understands that and only that. But in another context, it may mean a set of stages, which is something different. In yet another bounded context, that stages, that, sorry, that shipment may be represented as a set of problems and action that can be taken to address that problem. There may be some similarities between this model, but understanding that the subject matter experts realize that there are differences in these models, in fact, actually helps us use those boundaries in a meaningful way. And it's meaningful because we can segregate them in a way that each and every one of these models can evolve independently to meet specific business requirements and also do that in a way that it doesn't affect the other ones. So that's why I mean, that's why I, I refer to meaningful decomposition. You can definitely decompose this in other strategies, but other strategies run the risk of uh, when you need to have a new feature work on a particular area of code that this bleeds into the other bounded context. So some tools to help you as well on top of that. So bounded context is the theory and it's the thing that you should be trying to uh, achieve in order to uh, get that kind of decomposition. But uh, context mapping is one tool that can help you identify relationships between uh, the different bounded contexts. And uh, this will help you get uh, to more meaningful ones. But also a very powerful workshop is, uh, is one called event storming. In event storming, all of the people, all of the stakeholders, all of the developers, or potentially users, if you can find business analysts, UX, everybody involved in building a product, go into a room and basically create a model of the system that uh, they're going to be building. And that happens from the perspective of meaningful events. And so events that the subject matter experts recognize, something like um, shipment manifested, so terms from the domain, terms that the um, subject matter experts understand. And we recognize, from, we start recognizing using those events to recognize differences in meaning. So we can see that uh, a shipment, when it creates, when it's created, is referred to as a shipment. Somewhere else, it's referred to as a consignment. That change indicates a, a change of meaning, a change of term used indicates that there is a boundary there. In other cases, we can recognize that. So we need this, this event that occurs here includes some properties, but somewhere else we're only interested in a subset of those properties. And that's because the definition of a shipment changes. So it's very useful. Um, this this, this um, workshop is very useful to actually allow us to come up with those uh, sort of boundaries. And uh, that's, um, I think I will take the opportunity to uh, mention this awesome quote from Alberto Brandolini, who's the creator of the story who said that it is not the domain expert's knowledge that goes into production, it's the developer's assumption of that knowledge that goes into production. Which is essentially it means that it's what the developers understand the requirements to be, regardless of how they got those requirements, that actually goes into production. It would be awesome if we, can, if we could take the subject matter experts and deploy them to production, but unfortunately that's not possible. That's why we have software to, um, that's why we develop the software. So this is really useful, as I said, because understanding what the subject matter experts need and, and, and know will actually help us come up with a, a meaningful a boundary for the boundary context. But also this helps me and introduces me to my next slide, which is next is avoid persistence and domain model impedance. So the, the impedance between a normal front database and a domain model, so a SQL database and a model that we use in production um, well, the code is funny, uh, is known. Uh, what is less known is that this impedance actually spans uh, not just SQL server, uh, sorry, not just SQL databases, 
uh, document databases as well. In other, um, in other databases like Graph database, for example, has exactly the same problem. And this problem is that the, uh, the persistence model uh, will almost invariably end up becoming uh, different than the one that is running in production. Document databases are a bit sneaky. So document databases have an implicit schema. They don't have an explicit schema. And what happens is that, especially in the beginning, the, the, the schema, the implicit schema that the documents have in the database, if you use a document database for your uh, right path, so where your business logic runs in a sense, you will find out that at the beginning, it's, it's exactly the same as your domain model. It's, it, it has exactly the information that you want your domain to run. And when it starts, everything is fine. And it is. The problem starts becoming when uh, new features are introduced. So when you introduce new features uh, and, and you, uh, your packing store for your right path, they say that in the document database, things start becoming uh, a little bit difficult to maintain. As new features are introduced and you need data from uh, relationships across those documents, actually reshaping uh, so whole collections of documents, uh, it starts becoming a challenge and is a bit risky uh, to do. And that, that kind of challenge um, becomes more and more pronounced as more and new discoveries happen. So of course, this is not, this does not happen across all partner contexts. If you have stable uh, services like notifications, for example, that, that need to send an email, the domain is pretty stable. You won't be changing what you have there. But for, for your core domain where you are innovating uh, in order to provide value to your customers, that's, that's, that's where this risk starts to appear and that's where this is the biggest problem you address this the only so the only real solution to this uh, is using event sourcing and the reason that the event sourcing is a solution is because uh or is, is because of two reasons first of all you can delegate the responsibility to your subject matter experts and your subject matter experts actually know for a fact already what events are happening on a particular entity and so you can use exactly that knowledge almost as is in COVID verbatim to, to be used as the persistence of, of those entities. The second reason that this happens is that those events are much more slowly changing. Even as you are innovating within your domain because you are discovering those events from, it, uh, from your discussion with the subject matter experts who know this domain fundamentally, the changes to this tend to become incremental. And moreover, even, even if you find out that some of the events need to change, those changes are very, very isolated. So it may be on a particular event type, which are easier to actually address. Now, adopting event sourcing is not something that is easy. Although having said that, I just want to say that a lot of the advice that, is the, that, that exists in the internet is not really true. So a lot of people are, have very bad experiences with event storming, sorry, event sourcing. Um, but I think, um, and, and based on what I'm seeing in my own experience, is that event sourcing is very different to uh, what, what one does with a normal form database or a, or a document database. So there is a definitely um, a, a, a learning to be had between that and a lot of mistakes that can be had until um, one becomes familiar with, with event sourcing. Having said that, nothing is more complicated when you're using event sourcing. Uh, in fact, it, it starts becoming easier, things becoming easier. It's just there is some uncertainty uh, for a lot of people. So in that case, I would strongly suggest that you adopt event sourcing uh, in, a, in, a, in a bounded context that is not that core and not that important until you get some familiarity before adopting it on some of your uh, core bounded contexts. But it definitely solves a very big problem. And if you're a junior team and you're just starting, uh, that may be something that you want to adopt in the beginning to get experience. Tip number three is reducing coupling. So there are different types, types of coupling. Uh, and the few advice that I'm providing here actually tackle almost, almost all of them. Um, so first of all, one thing that you can do to attack coupling is use event-driven architectures. So the way that you communicate internally in your system through, should be through asynchronous events. It's not always possible, of course, because if you have requirements for very low latency, message-based communication is not going to help you. But but given that a lot of the communication can in fact be asynchronous, you should take advantage of that uh, relaxed requirements. And, and this, from my experience, is more often, it happens more often than it doesn't. Um, adopting a message-driven communication and more specifically event-driven communication 
uh, allows you to have drastically reduced coupling. Drastically reduced coupling means in the context of uh, event driven communication uh, that you do not have a temporal coupling between your services. So if uh, service A needs to talk with service B, it can do so even if service B is down. So it will publish an event and then service B, when it comes up, it will notice that it and then process it normally and then execution will continue. So you can still be, be available to your customers and still respond accordingly even though some of the dependencies are maybe offline at the moment. And this is important not because it, it, it can be down like something catastrophic happened, but it can be down because of load, it can be down because of whatever reason. Um, this will still allow you to be available. Applying reactive principles uh, is another thing, another, another tip that um, I wanted to mention because reactive principles and reactive, pro reactive programming is actually um, a methodology that is, has been around for, uh, for, for decades, in fact. And there is a large body of knowledge around how to design reactive applications. I will certainly suggest that you um, tap into that knowledge. And if, uh, another tip is preferred choreography. So choreography is um, basically publishing that information, publishing a change, or publishing uh, an information or a decision made from one service, and then have observers to that respond to that uh, to that change uh, without actually somebody having to tell them to do something. So a service A publishing a change, service B notices that change and then does its own actions and then publishes some information which can then be picked up by another service later on. So that chaining is, is, is what choreography means. It's the, diff, it's the exact opposite of having choreography, which is having a central orchestrator that says, you do that, you do that, you do that, you do that. And if there is any failure, it goes back. So you undo, you undo, you undo, you undo. Choreography is, is, is really good because it, it breaks down the, um, the central uh, orchestrator that needs to depend on multiple other services in order for an important workflow to happen. This is another thing where it, it's not always possible to do this and it's not always the best option, but I would say that that's why it says prefer choreography uh, rather than use choreography. But in the case of short workflows or workflows that have very easy um, error recovery steps, uh, choreography works very nicely and I would strongly suggest to adopt this. And finally, another option that's um, basically kind of a nuclear option that which works quite nicely though, if you can do this, uh, is the situation of, uh, so the architecture where you share nothing. So you don't share any kind of data and any kind of models across your public context. The way to do this is basically you disseminate the information upon entry of the system to all of the services um, that will need those pieces of information. And then all of the communication across the services happen through a contextful event with just IDs. So it will be something like a shipment manifested and the ID is this. There is nothing else in that event. It will be shipment went into exception and then it will be an ID and nothing else. All of the services that need to respond to these kind of events will have all of the necessary information and data there duplicated. So um, it's, it's a bit, there are some trade-offs of course, but if you can tolerate that duplication of data, share nothing architectures, work amazingly well. Tip number four, have meaningful test coverage. Test coverage is another thing that can actually explode your uh, deployment times. And it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a touch, touchy subject. Um, but what I'm gonna be discussing and focusing on uh, the tips that I'm gonna be saying here is uh, basically how to, um, what worked for me basically. <laughs> so one of the things that worked nicely for me is uh, using an onion architecture. Onion architecture is a type of layer architecture where uh, outer layers of code um, have dependencies that only point inwards. So this is beneficial, why? Because it allows you to um, put business logic right at the core and that business logic will depend on nothing. It will not depend on persistent models. It will not depend on application concerns, it will not, you know, application concerns are stuff like uh, messaging, logging and, and anything. So it will depend basically on nothing. So this is really important because you can very quickly and very efficiently and very targeted have a very good coverage of the important bits of your system, which is the business logic. And you can do that quite easily. 
Now, and especially if you adopt event sourcing, this becomes even easier. It will be given this past decision, given this request, I expect this decision as an outcome. Now, on top of that, um, and on the owner architecture will allow you to have a very quick, small amount of tests for um, infrastructure. And then you can have an even smaller number of integration tests and end-to-end -end tests to actually check that things are working together. Um, how to reduce development time dependencies. Uh, development time dependencies is uh, a, de a dependency on delivering the a feature that you want. So uh, you need team B to finish something in order for you to deliver uh, your own video for. Bound contexts help here again, because make sure that the responsibility and behavior is isolated on a single bounded context. That alone is not enough, but structuring your teams around bounded context and using it in driven architectures um, basically closes the, the set of things that, uh, that you need to do in order to reduce that. Because since uh, uh, teams fully own the bounded context, so one team can own more than one, but uh, one bounded context is only owned by one uh, team, it means that the changes that, are, um, that need to happen on one bounded context can be done and delivered in one team. And uh, the bounded context helps make sure that the necessities is only on that one bounded context rather than more. Um, and the final tip is, uh, so uh, there is a, a large amount of waste uh, regarding having to do rework and then waste in the form of doing work preemptively without actually knowing that this is needed. Um, in order to reduce uh, uh, rework, uh, what I suggest is adopting an improvement budget, which is allocating a specific amount of time for the tech team um, to uh, work on technical debt that they design. So it's, the business will just dedicate the time. They will not be pushing for feature requests during that time. And the, knowing the, prioritize, the, the prioritization, the technical team can then go and attack um, uh, technical debt where it exists and, and, it, it, and it will give them the um, best back for the bank. Uh, another thing, another way uh, to reduce a reward is having cross-functional teams. And when I say cross-functional teams here, I don't refer to front-end and server side or front-end and infrastructure. Whatever. I'm really talking about uh, product and UX and business analysts and testers and anything, anyone involved in actually building that product, sitting together then and there. And it also touches on the next point on the one piece flow because all of these people are now able to make decisions and the right ones as well, in order of how to implement these things. And the pool-based uh, model uh, that I suggest is basically to make sure that the, uh, the development team is uh, not overburdened. An overburdened um, a team will, uh, will cut corners in delivering a set of features, which will drastically increase the technical debt, um, which will then have an impact on the work. And finally, another thing is to uh, carefully considering all of the attack modes. So when we are uh, in need to make a decision on what to do or what approach to take, um, considering all of the alternatives uh, will help us make sure that uh, we don't need to redo a, sp a specific feature. Consider what is the, so basically the question is changing, is this good enough from what option available to us globally is the best for us? And uh, that's it. Uh, this is some of the reference material that I used in uh, creating the framework and uh, but more specifically uh, speaking about this presentation, there is a significant uh, number of books outside of uh, the ones here that uh, went into this talk. <laughs> uh, and um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Are there any questions from anybody? I guess the talk was really, really good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
No questions. You covered everything. I, uh, I, I, I'm I pretty sure I didn't. Uh, so I, 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 my presentation here is, again, is focused on um, trying to tell you uh, what to do. I didn't go uh, into any detail about how you actually can achieve each of those individual tips. So you will definitely need to read about event storming uh, in order for that to be successful. You have a lot to read and experiment regarding adopting event sourcing itself. But I, again, these are things that I have I found to work. The idea here is really transferring, by saving you that uh, the trouble of, of researching on how to tackle this kind of uh, different um, blockers that you may find on your, on your uh, in process of designing and working on the system. Oh. There's one question. Can you talk more about the difference between contract tests and so, A2A? What is the... Uh, yes. Uh, Sorry, there are two questions going on at the same time. I was reading the one that was uh, written. So yes, can you so, talk a bit more about the difference uh, between contract tests yeah. and A2A? What is a good ratio and co uh, coverage? Well, um, I, I'll talk... So the, the difference between contract tests and end to tests. So contract tests are uh, high... Um, uh, I'm sorry, but so a very uh, happy, a very quick tests uh, that will let you know whether you broke a public contract for uh, for a service. Whenever you are de de deploying a service, uh, that service has public contract. Now that can, public contract may be uh, a SOAP, it may be HTTP, it may be in the case of event-driven architectures, there are probably some messages in the form of some commands and some events, uh, and those represent the public contract for the service. Now, uh, contract-based testing will very, very efficiently and quickly tell you whether uh, the version of the message that gets deployed has a breaking change with the one that is currently in production. Now, this is obviously quite important when we're speaking about HTTP, but it's equally important when we're speaking about messaging. Because we, in messaging, perhaps it's a little bit more pronounced because we need to be aware and be able to handle uh, messages that are currently in flight. So because, exactly because of that asynchronous nature when you are deploying, probably you have, like, I don't know, 100, 200 messages uh, on, on your bus. It doesn't matter which bus it is. I mean, it can, Kafka, it can be Arabic, it's, it's whatever you use. But those messages need to be deserializable so that they can be consumed. And contract based testing will like, very quickly tell you whether you can actually deserialize and understand it. The end to end tests are uh, what we know of end to end tests. So, for end to end tests, is uh, onboarding. So, you have a journey for onboarding, and uh, you just you know that taking action A, B, and C uh, actually allows you afterwards to log in, or um, taking action of so a manifesting shipment. I can notice that uh, the shipment has been manifested with the carrier, that we can actually query it in our system. So things that are happening system-wide. So the system is the black box in the case of an end to end, and we're hitting it like that. So it's user tests considering the system as a black box. So that's, that's the difference between these two. From the perspective of group creation coverage, so coverage is actually a good point. Now, what, I, what the Onion architecture will, will allow, it will allow very efficient tests that have uh, almost 100% coverage of your business logic. This is easy to do with Onion architecture, uh, as, as long as you follow it correctly. And, uh, and it's also uh, not that difficult to maintain, as long as you also can, uh, adopt some of the other practices of uh, meaningful decomposition. But even if you don't, the, the uh, maintaining those specific tests individually. So if you don't find changes in your business logic, uh, or at least reshaping that within the service, you will notice that these are very easy to maintain, um, exactly because you don't have, ah, by the way, this will allow you to also not have mocks, I don't know, depending on uh, what kind of uh, um, stack you are on. Uh, the fact that you actually, the, the business logic depends on nothing means that you don't need to mock storage, you don't need to mock messaging, you don't need to provide stuff for logging, you, you don't, you, nothing of that is important. The business logic is pure, depends on nothing, so, you, and, and literally with event sourcing is awesome because you can say decision A, decision B, command, and you expect a, a, an event out, nothing else. You don't need to inject anything. So, business, 
Averaging of business logic close to 100%. Uh, I will say infrastructure should be covered. We can cover it quite nicely from the perspective of infrastructure. Uh, but obviously, end to end tests start becoming a little bit less. I mean, integration tests also, it's, it's less than the domain. Uh, I, I, ratio depends on, on, on your platform, I guess. I, I can't really comment on that. Any other questions? I think James had a question. I did. I've just I've just typed it in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, so, who, who is it that does the event storming workshop? Um, is it something that that a like a product manager would run with people, or, or is it developers only, or is it the whole cross-functional team like, who goes to that sort of thing? And the reason I'm asking is that I'm um, uh, a sort of developer turned into product, and I and I and I know about event storming, but I don't see it much as uh, something that's recommended for. It's not something that product managers talk about amongst themselves much, event storming. Um, um, what's your perspective on that? Should they talk more about it? Of course, of course. So again, I go back to Brandolini's uh, quote, because you really, I mean, as a product owner, you just want to know that what you're delivering to production is what your customers need. And also, as a product owner, you are responsible that things are, need to work as the subject matter experts understand that it's going to be working, right? I mean, if you are in shipping, you need to understand about ships. You need to understand how uh, ports work and what needs to happen and what forms need to be filled in. And that needs to happen with, within so, some regulations. And the event storming workshop is awesome because it allows you to discover this and also make sure that everybody, and, and that's why everybody needs to be in that workshop, uh, comes out with a shared understanding of what needs to be built. So it's really, really powerful. I cannot, I honestly, I cannot um, over express too much how important this is. I, I, I'm sure I cannot do it justice, how long I did, doesn't matter how long I took. It, it's really, really, really powerful. It can save you months of experimentation. So it makes sure that everybody involved in, the meeting, in, the, uh, in building the product is there, and everybody knows exactly what uh, the subject matter experts understand. So. Yeah, definitely have everyone in there. Definitely have them. And uh, it's also quite powerful to happen, uh, not just on the beginning of a project, although that's the more important part, in my opinion, uh, but also do it iteratively. So every, I don't know, every quarter or whatever makes sense to you, whenever a big goal or a big milestone is reached, I will say that uh, do it once more uh, so that it's a... Um, everybody understand what's the lessons that we learned during that, uh, that, that period of time and, and, and potentially a given opportunity to uh, remodel uh, the system. So this basically remodeling the system is um, taking on new lessons from the domain because if you are innovating, you are bound to learn some stuff that, some stuff that you didn't know about. And, and so it will allow you to adapt that model uh, to the need of customers. Um, did I cover your question, James? You did, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we missed a question. I've got, one, I've got a question. Uh, just, I was just thinking, do you see um, event storming as a replacement for uh, story mapping? Or, and how do you see the two, if, if not, how do you see the two fitting in together? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question. Um, so basically, I, I, I absolutely doesn't replace user story mapping. Um, when event storming got introduced, it, 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 there was a lot of excitement around event storming, which is, from my perspective, I, I, can, I can fully understand that excitement um, because it really is a very powerful workshop. But it does have some, um, uh, some gaps. And one of the gaps is exactly, it lacks that focus on, uh, on, on the needs of the end user. If you can get a user actually in your event storming session, that is kind of covered, uh, but it still lacks a focus on what they need. They will have a voice, which is it's good, but it, it doesn't have a voice. They, sorry, it doesn't have a focus on that aspect. It has a focus on discovering how things should be working in order to meet some requirements. So that's why a lot of people have a huge amount of success adopting event storming 
uh, in established systems. So the requirements were already well known or relatively well known. There may be some questions in parts, but at least the how the system should be working was already established. And so the event storming workshop made, it gave the opportunity for, for developers to actually interact directly with subject matter experts and make sure that they, they all have a shared understanding. And also for uh, tech uh, capabilities and problems feedback into subject matter experts' knowledge. And so that, that, that was really powerful. But as I said, there was a gap there. And that's where user story mapping really, really shines. I mean, with user story mapping, we are able to actually discover and identify that, um, um, what our users need. So how the system should be working as a black box, not uh, internally. So what, what I have found quite successful is doing one and then the other. I do the, events, the story mapping session beforehand I produce a certain set of artifacts, I publish those artifacts to the development team, and then during the event storming session, we have a quick validation of the model that we have created in the event storming session by comparing it to the user story map, uh, user story map that we have. So we can very quickly evaluate that, okay, so we have this journey that we need to support, this happy path, this sub path, and we can easily see because it's, event, uh, it's the events, the domain events that are represented in the event storming session, that, that this model actually meets those requirements or this model is lacking on, on different parts. And if it's lacking, we actually can um, redo some of that uh, event storming session more focused, knowing that this is missing. And so we can fill it in. And that's a, that's a quicker feedback rather than the traditional approach of event storming of, you do the event storming session, and you go out on an experiment or a very short uh, spike of like a week uh, and, and, and trying to come up with a, a proof of concept to see if it works. And then you do another event storming session and you go back and, and back and forth like that, which probably you will still need to do this, but uh, the user story map will save you some of those iterations in order to validate. You will, the, the first time you go out of the event storming session, you will have a, a reasonable model. It may not be the best, but it, it's going to cover the basics at least, all of the basics that you need. Any other question? I think we missed one from earlier. Uh, I see most of what is covered is in this talk is closely related to event-driven architecture. How to act if even event-driven doesn't fit in the project? How to, sorry? How to act if event-driven doesn't fit in the project? That's a good, that's a good question again. Um, so thank, for, thank you for the good questions, everyone, first of all. I, I, I really enjoy answering questions. Uh, so uh, that's not quite true. So yeah, there, definitely uh, there are a couple of points that event even architectures greatly help, uh, but um, it, it's, it doesn't, it's not a necessity for all of these, uh, for all of these points. So for example, uh, you, can, you can still use uh, event storming, even though your system is entirely uh, lacking in events. So you don't have any kind of events anywhere. Um, and um, so the composition can happen. Uh, let's go actually some, back to some of these, uh, back to some of these tips. Uh, so the composition can happen without events. So there's absolutely no need to do this. And the events, you can, you can use them for persistence. You don't need to actually communicate across the services with events. So you can still take advantage of events sourcing, even if you are communicating over HTTP. And actually, this is happening on the system that I'm building right now. So there is a, a one part of the requirements uh, necessitate a very low latency communication between the services, which is not really ideal in an asynchronous communication. Uh, in with asynchronous communication. So but we still use event sourcing because we have the requirements for auditing and we have the requirements to uh, ask speculative questions with event sourcing is really powerful to do. So it will allow you to ask questions of what was the answer two days ago? Or what was the answer a year ago? Or what will be the answer uh, two weeks from now in the future? Uh, which is an amazing tool for debugging very well. So uh, this can happen without uh, messaging, even if you are using uh, um, HTTP communication. Uh, reducing coupling, you can still do the choreography aspect. So you can do this, but it's a little bit of, uh, um, uh, of, of manual labor to actually make sure that you have some anti-corruption layer that uh, changes the necessity, sorry, 
So you can still do um, HTTP, uh, but, but have them in a, um, a change to fit the dependencies. So use something like webhooks uh, to actually have other services subscribe, but still the communication can be synchronous. So choreography can still happen. It's a little bit of a manual labor to, to do this. The testing obviously has um, is not affected by that. Um, reducing the development time around the dependencies. So event-driven architecture really help. You will not be getting the maximum benefit if you, if you don't have event-driven architectures, but it's still, so you will still have behavioral coupling, you will still have um, that uh, temporal coupling as well, but it's, it's, it's not that bad. And uh, reducing reward and waste, again, um, you can still have the event storming session, you can still uh, uh, swarm on a ticket. So a lot of these, so you, you, you start to gain by adopting event-driven architectures, but it's not a prerequisite to, to doing that. Having said that, finally, um, what I wanted to say is that it's very often, uh, if you probe your domain experts, you will see that they have, uh, the latencies that they can tolerate are in fact quite high. So you will say, go speak to someone and they, they will say, ah, as soon as possible. But if you start probing them and asking them questions, you will find out that what they mean by immediately is an hour <laughs> because that's what they did before and it works perfectly for them. And it, it, it depends, of course. I mean, if you are, if you are asking questions or so a query, uh, you need to respond efficiently and not uh, so immediately. And latency has to be slow, uh, sorry, low. And so you can actually, like, that's going to be an HTTP communication. But queries are on the boundary of your system. The point is your right point. So making decisions. A decision which will cause a change on that, on that read model more often than not, and I'm talking about the vast majority of cases, can happen with a higher latency that is uh, that, that, that event-driven architectures and message-driven architectures can tolerate. So here, basically, I'm giving a tip, it's CQRS. So if you're familiar with CQRS, this, is, this means that basically you are able to almost instantaneously, by the way, answer queries, uh, but it, the, the right path is, is much slower. It's not something that is easy, again, it needs, uh, it, it comes with its own trade-offs. It's not like event sourcing in, uh, that is um, quite easy to, uh, to adopt and it doesn't have a lot of problems as long as you get familiar with it. CQRS does have trade-offs, but it, it, it may be of interest in, in some cases. Anyone else? Or, or, or did we run out of time? There? Uh, we are we are out of time actually. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much, Salas. I think it was a very good talk. Thank you.